show throughout today's event. Please use the chat or the Q&A to submit your questions. I'm Jill Hobson, Institutional Program Manager for IMS Global, and today with me is Kara Jenkins, Marketing Communications Director. For those of you who may not be familiar with IMS Global, we are a nonprofit member collaborative. Our members include leading districts, state organizations, higher ed institutions, and educational technology suppliers working together to innovate and improve the EdTech ecosystem to enable better learning and better learning technology through plug and play integration, open architecture, and the assurances that come from IMS Global Certification. Each member district has evolved their own unique strategy and approach based on their unique situation. Yet all of these districts are collaborating on the open IT and integrated curriculum architecture that enables this flexibility. CASE is at the center of all the ways that learning standards impact the teaching and learning process. As districts move to the implementation of digital learning platforms and tools, they are facing challenges with content interoperability from multiple sources. As these resources are ingested into teaching and learning platforms, the challenge is learning standards data are not published in a machine-readable format. So what's happening right now is that aggregating information from multiple platforms and tools and apps is like trying to puzzle together pieces from different puzzles. It's really impossible. So CASE is a universal framework for representing learning standards, competencies, rubric, and relationships among each of these for educational technology applications and platforms. CASE formatted standards can be published in a flexible database and so CASE provides that framework for learning standards, or you could say competencies or learning objectives. And CASE provides a framework for, for, for transmitting rubrics, including performance criteria for various platforms. And very importantly, CASE defines relationships between and among standards, like being able to show that the relationship between standards one precedes another or one standard is related to another or a competency might be an exemplar uh, or standard may be a peer of or a part of another standard. CASE can de demonstrate learning progressions. CASE can support student exemplars with associations to learning standards and competencies. CASE makes learning connections possible. CASE is like a Rosetta Stone, a universal translator for connecting learning standards and competencies across platforms and for showing relationships between standard sets. So now let's turn to seeing CASE in action. That's why we're really here today. We have a great slate of guest speakers today. I'd like to welcome all of our guest speakers including Ray Baranowski from Safari Montage, Diana Vitalisku from School City, Brandon Dorman from ACT, James Gambrell from ACT, Greg Nadeau from Public Consulting Group, Keith Osborne from the Georgia Department of Education, and Pepper Williams from School City. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Keith to get us started. Thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Keith Osborne with the Georgia Department of Education, and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes telling you about CASE and, and specifically uh, talking about the problem that it has solved for us in Georgia or is beginning to solve. So our agency is currently undergoing a transformation, um, and, and this conversation as it relates to that transformation uh, is, is going to coalesce around uh, academic standards. Uh, for Georgia Department of Education, um, we have academic standards that are published, and we call those our Georgia Standards of Excellence, or GSE. 
We have previous versions of these standards that we call Georgia Performance Standards. These standards define what students should know about each subject. I'd like to welcome everybody that's, uh, that's represented. As, as, uh, as you see here on the screen, you note that we have state, we have higher ed, we have districts, and then we have uh, educational suppliers and whatnot that are with, with us today. Uh, it kind of shows and it documents the importance of this work um, and necessitates the need for us to have this conversation. So. At this moment, academic standards are mandated by the Georgia legislative body and we revisit these standards um, about every four years. The work of creating and vetting these standards occurs within the curriculum and learning unit which is one of the subunits of the larger teaching and learning team of the Georgia Department of Education. And what happens prior to, to us having this discussion today, um, the curriculum and instruction folks meet and uh, the derivatives of their work are the published standards. And uh, that final product of their work of creating and vetting these standards uh, was here to for a published PDF that was then placed on one of Godot's websites. Uh, that website is located at georgiastandards.org. One thing that we're seeing in Georgia is a measurable increase in spending on bandwidth, technology, and digital curriculums. So to help meet the needs of these districts and to better support them, virtual learning is now also a subunit of teaching and learning. To ensure that digital assets, both learning and assessment, are properly aligned with the most accurate versions of Georgia's academic standards, we needed to help both local districts and the vendor space that produces digital assets by working to make our standards available quickly and also to ensure their accuracy. The solution was to leverage learning technologies and specifically release our standards in a machine-readable format. Consistency and portability of our standards are ensured by leveraging the CASE specification released by the IMS Global Organization, CASE, or as Jill said earlier, Competencies and Academic Standards Exchange, is the IMS Global specification that notates the way by which standards and or competencies are digitally encased. Thus, learning technologies that are now equipped in just CASE files can easily associate digital assets to the correct academic standard or competency and they are also incurring the correct version is being used. Meanwhile, many discussions of the teaching and learning team are centered around what we're saying is student-centered pedagogy or some of you may say personalized learning. Our belief is that as we help and support districts with their curricular and learning technologies, we'll also begin to realize an opportunity to make assertions about a student's mastery or competency of learning. Thus, the work of CASE is very necessary for us to be able to help both our agency and local districts transition to one that's able to leverage learning technologies to help them quantify competency-based learning in a more formative fashion. I'm going to pass it over to Greg for a minute, and he's going to take over and, and discuss a, a, a little bit more uh, technical work around uh, the case specification. Greg? Terrific. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Jill. Um, this is exciting to be with so many members of the uh, community here, um, and I think we all sense that this is an inflection point in the marketplace where um, open ecosystems are now beginning to be possible. Um, as Jill uh, introduced, the idea of CASE is to develop machine-readable competency and academic standards and linked data. There are three main object types, the competency framework document, which is like the cover page, the competency framework items, which are both the nodes in the taxonomies and the statements themselves and competency framework association, where relationships between competency framework, competency framework items within a framework, as well as across frameworks, can be modeled. So 
within the framework. We might use is child of to describe the primary taxonomy of the framework. We might use precedes to describe the learning progressions within a framework. And we might use exact match of, is related to, and is part of to describe the types of relationships that um, are expressed in crosswalks between frameworks. These crosswalks are at the center of what we're doing together with CASE. These frameworks did not exist in a vacuum by themselves. Many states have adopted the Common Core or Next Generation Science Standards or the Computer Science Teacher Associations or other national frameworks as a baseline for their state standards. They then modify those standards in some important ways and make them available. Districts then create additional organizational schemes on top of those state schemes. Each of those we call a derivative framework. And vendors, particularly assessment vendors, have their own derivative frameworks to uh, model reporting categories. So this is really what CASE is designed to solve. Machine readable, linked data, competency frameworks, and crosswalks. The data model is published in UML at the IMS spec um, after it was approved this summer as IMS's newest spec. Um, the companies that are represented here all have certified products, and sometimes we work together and sometimes we compete um, as it should be. And I want to talk a little bit more about what we're doing together with Georgia. So after creating the Georgia uh, standards.org case framework, we then started talking about how these case items really propagate through really everything that George is doing. We've identified two proof of concepts, and um, we're working with the Georgia Department of Education and a host of other vendors, and welcome anyone who is interested in participating in these proof of concepts to contact Keith or myself after the call. The, I'm going to talk about them just very quickly. What we call proof of concept two, although it's sort of to the left, but it came first, uh, second, is about dynamic OER content and LTI resource search, how we embed co aligned content into multiple learning management systems. Proof of concept one, so-called, um, because it's where we really started together with Georgia Department of Ed, is about the idea of competency assertions, making manifest this idea that Georgia Virtual, Code.org, edX, Khan Academy, Google CS First, Simple Web or Mobile Form, all can create these competency assertions about they as agents claiming that a learner, the subject, possesses a competency, a skill, an ability at a particular level based on certain evidence with confidence at a certain time. Georgia Department of Ed has taken the CSTA, uh, Computer Science Teacher Association, a national framework and created the Georgia version of it. They're beginning to align the code.org uh, content, which here shows alignments to a prior version. And the, the Godot people certainly mentioned, well, wouldn't it be great if code.org was using SALT or a case tool so that that way the crosswalk from, to the, from these old 2011 standards could be easily translated into the new standards rather than them having to recode their web pages. More significantly, we're going to be taking these activities, these learning activities that are tagged to competencies and create, again, those competency assertions to drive through the Open Badge Initiative um, badges that are competency-based and linked through Open Pathways. Um, I'm going to now, let's see, um, Jill, how are we doing on time? Doing well? Yeah, yeah you're okay. Okay. So I'm just going to show what I'm going to demo. I'll do a live demo in a second, but I just want to quickly show what it's going to be. It's going to show just how easy it is um, to use this open source tool, OpenSalt, to create a framework, 
then to, um, here it is created then, and then to pick another framework that it's derived from and to drag that right into the framework that we created to model these exact match of relationships. So I'm going to now show that um, live by sharing my, one sec, <clears throat> share application, there we go. And we're in <coughs> opensalt.net, <coughs> which is PCG's multi-tenant version of SALT. Our um, partners, School City and OpenEd ACT and EduWorks have their own versions of OpenSALT that they're running, um, but this is one that we have brought up. And so I'm going to show here now just creating a new framework. What I'll actually do is, I did ISTE in the slides, but I'm going to do a different one, which is um, my wife, Greg's wife, who's a seventh grade social studies teacher in Somerville. So we're going to create Greg's wife framework. And we're going to say that Greg was the one who created it. Um, and um, I'm going to put it as, I'm going to keep this one for now just as a private draft so it doesn't show up anywhere. I'm going to create that. Okay, so here's Greg's Wife Framework. And as I said, <clears throat> she's a uh, seventh grade teacher um, in um, Massachusetts. Um, so I'm going to now go and go to the Massachusetts Frameworks. And I'm going to pick the new 2017 ELA standards. And she teaches seventh grade. And so now I'm going to just take the seventh grade and drop it right in there. And um, what you can see here, oh, if I can just get to that. Um, little ghosting thing. <laughs> um, oh, come on. There we go. This is a, a, a the joys of open source where we're all working together. We're we're working out with the other team, the rest of the team, the uh, the QA um, that will be associated with the next release. But here now you can see that it automatically creates a copy of that standard and it knows that it's an exact match of that Massachusetts framework. So it, automat it just brought over the Massachusetts framework and automatically created an association of exact match of. Now if she wanted to, um, to change it, she could then just go in and edit this. So instead of recognizing correct inappropriate, we're going to say that she, inappropriate, we're going to say appropriate shifts. And then she could say, this is no longer an exact match of. So now it's no longer connected to that. She could take these frameworks, she could group them by unit. So she could create a fall set of learning targets. Um, she could, um, uh, um, and then import them into Schoology or whatever standards-based grading program she's using. So that's um, what I wanted to demo, and I will now hand it over to Brandon, um, who will talk about some of the work that ACT is doing. Excellent. So if I could have control of the screen now, thank you. So my name is Brandon Dorman. I'm with ACT over Open Ed Content. Joining me also is Dr. James Gambrell, research scientist at ACT. And James is going to talk a little bit about why ACT is involved with CASE and the Open Sol project. Thanks, Brandon. Um, ACT has been working on machine readable standards uh, internally for uh, over four years now. Um, we originally developed our own framework management system and our own machine readable format. Um, when we heard about CASE, we became involved and have recently adopted it as our data format for storage and transfer of frameworks, standards, learning progressions, and alignments. 
we get a lot of requests to share our standards, and um, we need to publish these standards in a machine-readable format to power web applications and visualizations that allow customers to explore the standards and the alignments, and also um, provide a link between test scores and learning activities and other content on uh, open ed. We're going to be transitioning from our current framework management system over to OpenSALT. We're going to be providing a lot of QA and uh, enhancing the tool. We're using OpenSALT to debut the um, ACT Holistic Framework for public comment in the fall. This is a visualization of the framework here. This is ACT's new broader vision of college and career readiness, which is moving beyond core academic skills to include cross-cutting uh, 21st century skills, as well as behavior and social emotional skills and career navigation. We've just finished enhancing OpenSALT to allow the collection of comments from users. We'll be inviting a community to sign up and get logins so they can review the framework and provide feedback and suggestions. We're also planning to use OpenSALT to create alignments between the holistic framework and other sets of standards, state standards, common core, PISA, uh, et cetera. And uh, Brandon's going to demonstrate what that looks like in the tool. Yeah, thanks, James. So here's a screenshot uh, of how the associations can work, but I actually am going to try and do a live demo as well here. So I should be able to share my screen. Okay. So this is our staging instance of OpenSALT, which has a version of a holistic framework on it. And in order to make associations between different frameworks, I simply go over here to associations, and you can kind of see we're, we're testing the commenting feature here. So I go to associations. I'm going to go ahead, and I've already loaded from Georgia just this morning, actually, the Georgia Standards of Excellence straight from Keith's server. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to search. So we have a search enabled, so I can just search for keywords here, which makes it really easy to find things. And then what I would do is I would simply go through here and I would say, oh, this, you know, this standard looks very similar or related to the other one. So I'm going to go ahead and just drag these over. Uh, case allows for different association types, which has kind of been touched on a little bit. And I don't think in the scope of this webinar we have time to go into the nuances of all of them. But it's a very good thing for those of us that are interested about competencies, um, even from an international perspective. So I'm going to go ahead and just say is related to. And when I associate that now, I go to represent data, and I can see now that it's related to that framework. And again, just highlighting the interconnectedness that others have mentioned, uh, when I click on this particular standard now, it's going to take me actually to that uh, other framework that is currently you know, living here on this server, but really it's pointing to Georgia's server. So ACT is very excited to, to continue to expand the uses of this tool. Um, this is, of course, just one particular use case. But what it will enable us to do is, is, again, be more consistent for students, for educators, and as well as organizations working to make competencies a better, more useful thing. So in this particular way, at OpenEd and ACT, we do have a lot of educational resources that are tied to the holistic framework statements. And so now we'd automatically be able to get resources that are applicable to that Georgia standard um, without you know, additional recoding and this kind of thing. So CASE is a, is a foundational tool that ACT is going to be using to help bring education and workplace success. Thank you. Go ahead, Ray. Hi, thank you. Um, um, this is Ray Baranowski. I'm from Safari Montage. We are a learning object repository, and we would be acting as a consumer in this um, working with, with case standards. So I'm going to run through a demonstration of pulling in a standard that's been worked on in, um, in the SALT tool. It's actually the same standard that Brandon was just showing, so I'll bring in that Georgia Standards of Excellence um, standard into our system and then show how we can correlate um, titles in our system to, to those standards. So let me grab the screen. All 
Okay. So we always had a local standards import interface for taking in sort of custom standards, um, state standards that weren't part of an, another system we may be pulling from. And, and they were in a CSV format. They were, they were, you know, it's not the easiest thing to, to develop and then import, but the working with case and the machine readable format and the, and the standardized model makes it, makes it easier for us to, to just work with work with endpoints, work with JSON downloaded files, and, and import them into the system. Um, so here we have a, a link in our regular local standards interface for grabbing a case standard. So in the form, which is as it is now, it's, it's, it's built at this point to accept a couple different things. Um, Ray, in this form, you could take Ray I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, um, we're not Seeing, I'm seeing gray screen, but I'm not actually seeing um, your demonstration. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. Uh, okay. Let me go back. Share. Okay. My apologies for that. Um, is it there now? Yep, thank you. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I will jump to the local standards interface, and here we have a link to import, and we have a form. Go down and select Georgia. Now, at this point in the development, we could take either a standard URI that links directly to the JSON endpoint, or we could take a JSON uploaded file, and from within the SALT tool, um, the information we need for the standard is, is here, and with their export, we could grab the JSON, um, or we could also, due to their the standard format for the endpoint, if we know the global ID for the standard, we can, we can import it right from the URI, and that's, that's what I'm, I'm going to demonstrate. So in this form, element, if I grab... the URI, and what's nice about the standardized URI format is it really allows us to script importing standards in the back end. There's a lot that we could do um, just being able to access these, um, you know, directly. So this is the Mathematics uh, Georgia Standards of Excellence. I will submit this, and it'll go through, show a little sort of more technical output, and then it will be imported. So, and that's it. So it's going to be in our system now. And we'll see. This is the imported standard. And everything would be in here and browsable. We can collapse and show all the different ones. And this would be a match of what was worked on within the SALT tool. So. From this point, now that you have the standards in the system, you're going to have some some content that you've uploaded into the Learning Object Repository, and you can align that content to to the standards that we've just imported. So, I have some user-created content that I've uploaded for the demonstration. So, if I edit a piece of content, go to Correlations, we'll see the newly imported standard in the dropdown. And then we'll be able to select, you know, say we want to correlate it to these, these guys. And then we submit. So now this title is now correlated to these learning targets. So that works from the, the item level. And then if we go backwards to sort of your browsing through the standards, working on your lesson or, or whatever you might be working on, um, if you're going through, you know, you'll be able to see in this interface that oh, you have some titles that are correlated to this, and then you can add them um, to your workflow um, or to whatever you're, you're working on. So also there'd be an interface from the detail page where you could also jump and see how you've correlated that piece of content. So it really does make bringing in standards in this machine-readable format very easy, very quick. Um, 
and then you can start working on what you need to work on. So thank you very much. That's pretty much all I have to, to show, and I will pass it back. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ray. And now we are going to turn to Pepper Williams at School City for a demo of assessment resources tagged to the Georgia Standards. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me, Jill? Yes, sir. Hear you great. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. So this is Pepper Williams from School City. Uh, I'm going to show something that's kind of similar to what Ray just showed, and we're just going to show a slightly different way uh, of using this same data uh, to do a similar, a, a similar thing here. So School City provides assessment services to districts across the country, uh, including a number of districts in Georgia. And of course, we need all of our, our assessment items um, aligned to state standards. Now, without CASE, uh, we've had to encode and store a full copy of every state standards in a School City database. Uh, then for any type of data integration we want to do with another system, we've had to go through a cumbersome process of making sure that our copy of each state's standards matches the other system's copy of the standards. Then uh, we've also had to agree on a set of matching global identifiers for every standard, and then, you know, that set of identifiers has to be matched for every system we try to integrate, okay? So it's a big mess. Um, with CASE, uh, these burdens uh, largely melt away. Uh, and I'm going to show kind of how we've uh, started using this uh, in practice. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the question authoring tool uh, for Popcorn, a new product that we're developing, that we're developing from the start to be case compliant. Uh, and here we're imagining that I'm editing a question that I'm creating for a district in Georgia. Uh, so as you see here, um, I'm aligning this question to the Georgia Standards of Excellence for uh, ELA. And the way we set things up here, when I click add uh, here in the School City authoring tool, what we're doing here is in an iframe, we're bringing up, we're hitting that exact um, open salt instance that uh, Greg and Brandon showed earlier uh, that's coming right from the Georgia DOE. So um, we're not even copying the standards in, we're just hitting the, the Georgia, uh, that Georgia uh, open salt case uh, repository directly. So from here, as uh, Brandon showed earlier, I could do a search um, and look for standards this way. Um, I can also just browse down, and so I could go down here, uh, find that standard that I want to align um, this question to. Uh, I can get some more information about it here, uh, including that global identifier. So here's that global identifier that Georgia is publishing. And what happens when I click choose here is that um, we copy into our database, uh, all we copy into the database is that identifier, okay? Uh, and that's all we need to store. So anytime we need more information about the standard, we can just, um, our server can just hit the case to find APIs on that Georgia open salt instance uh, to retrieve that uh, information. If Georgia needs to update and update any information about the standard later, uh, that's no problem. The next time we retrieve the standard using the case ID, we'll get that updated information. Uh, and best of all, say we want to pull a list of resources from Safari's LOR or OpenEd's LOR or anyone else that's using uh, case. Uh, say we want to pull a list of resources that align, uh, you know, to this standard. Since Safari or OpenEd or these other institutions would be pulling data from that same case repository we are, we just send the case identifier over to Safari and then they'll instantly know which standard we're asking about. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, without case, uh, we have to store, encode and store a copy of every state standard in a school city database, which is a cumbersome process. To integrate with another system, we have to figure out a way to align our copy with the other system's copy, and then we have to make sure the identifiers match across systems. Uh, with CASE, uh, we can search each state's, each state's standards on the fly using that state's master CASE repository. All we need to store in our system is that CASE identifier. 
uh, and then to integrate with another system, all we need to do is use those same standardized case identifiers with the other system. So in the end, you know, what we get is that it's much easier for School City to provide our customers with meaningful integrations uh, with other systems. Uh, and that's, a, that's, that's my presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Pepper. Um, so I'm going to ask my colleague now, Kara, to help us. She's been taking a look at the Q&A and um, going to ask her to help us go through some of the questions that have been coming up. And we'll um, ask some of our panelists to help answer questions. OK, great. Thanks, Jill. So the first question we have, and I believe um, I'll ask uh, Greg to address this as it was part of um, came in during your part of the presentation. Who is expected to create and manage the crosswalk relationship between, for example, Common Core and Georgia's version of some Common Core standards? Excellent question. Maybe we'll use, you know, um, a different national standard than the Common Core. <laughs> um, but let's say that Georgia wanted to align with the CSTA standards, for example, Computer Science Teachers Association standards, um, then Georgia would manage those crosswalks. So that's the simple answer. Whoever is the creator of the framework manages the crosswalks from that framework to other frameworks. OK, thank you. Um, moving on, and uh, Jill, perhaps uh, you could take this or direct to another person on the panel. Are the frameworks pulled in for all states? That's a great question, too, and no, we really wish all 50 states' um, standards had been converted to the case format, um, and, and they haven't been yet. We hope uh, that seeing what Georgia has done is a great model um, and, and stands as a lighthouse to prove that this can be done quickly and easily um, and that other states can do it. The good news is is that um, while the case standard was being developed, we did work with Florida to do a very small pilot um, with some Florida standards. Uh, we worked with CPALMS. Um, and if you're in Florida, you may, may be aware of CPALMS um, to do a little pilot and just test the idea of being able um, to convert uh, Florida standards into that case format. And that did go very successfully. Um, so we, you know, we're really hoping now to be able to move on to um, a full conversion of the Florida standards, as well as any other state. And I know, um, you know, I certainly speak for all of the panelists that, you know, we we are we stand ready um, to have conversations and help um, with anybody who's interested. Okay, thank you, Jill. Uh, more questions for the panel. I believe this came in, uh, Ray during your um, <clears throat> during your demo. Does the uh, case tool allow for export of standards and relationships to any other format? Um, <clears throat> for the SALT tool, I don't know if I'm the best uh, equipped to answer questions about the SALT tool. Um, I am, I'm only familiar with the export sort of that I showed, um, but maybe someone else more uh, familiar with the, case, the SALT tool can help? I, yeah, I we can, can say, yeah, I, I could say that, that. So there's a, yeah, sorry, sorry, Brandon. There's a, I mean, the standard format for case is, is JSON. That's kind of defined in the standard. Uh, and that's the format that's going to get you all the information from, from OpenSALT. We also have a, an export to uh, CSV in a, in a format. Uh, and we are, I think we, we had been working on export to PDF and export to HTML. I mean, it could be exported to any, to anything. But like I said, the, the case spec says that the official format is uh, is JSON. I don't know, Brandon, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, uh, it actually exports to a uh, spreadsheet uh, format with the case identifiers. So then you could modify that if you really needed to for whatever reason and upload it back. Um, but of course, yeah, we prefer that we that people are using the JSON uh, case file. And also, of course, uh, you know there are some nuances as to how you can host the framework. So you know, there's a, a direct link that you can get, and actually, that you know, that link is a is a static link with a, with a case identifier for the document. So you can just point to the web page, right, or 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 export in case or spreadsheet for now. Okay, thanks. 
um, moving on with questions. <clears throat> Let's assume we have two state departments of education, both which use CASE. How would it work for students who move between them? Would the receiving state department have to recode the competencies? In essence, how does portability work? So I think we're moving beyond just the standards themselves. So now we're talking about how they relate to um, the work of the student. Um, and, and so, you know, that could be in any number of different formats. Um, that might be in the form of work that was completed, um, you know, in a platform such as the one, you know, you saw Pepper demonstrating or the one that you saw Ray demonstrating um, or, or any other, you know, learning application and tool. One of the really great things would be that, um, you know, let's assume that we do have, you know, two states with standards that are um, aligned using case. Um, you know, it, it might be possible for a student's um, data to um, be contained and transferred uh, from one place to another. Um, you know, right now, I think probably the best um, example would be more like e-transcript, which is another area of work for IMS Global. Um, and that is sort of an extension of CASE. And, and uh, CASE is sort of a foundational piece for that work. Um, in order to be able to have an extended transcript that demonstrates students' work um, and, and gives them a way to show not just uh, traditional uh, competencies in learning, but all of the kinds of learning even beyond um, the classroom. Um, you need a, a framework to be able to, to contain those learning skills and competencies, and that's what CASE is um, going to be able to do. Um, so there is an area of work going on for that, and this will allow for it. If I could just add something briefly, too. I think it sounds like you're talking about student work. So if, that, if the ed tech provider of the vendor has like the student portfolio, is using case and what, what what Greg showed, he showed how the derivative framework was being made uh, with the you know the former standard or whatever being the is exact match of relationship, right? So if a student transfers, as long as there's a case uh, correlation or association, then I think that the student works would also student work would also transfer with the correct standard relationship. So Keith, you might want to. You know, I think, I think, thanks, Brandon. You know, the work that we're working together with Georgia on, I think, is directly on that. You know, it's not so much the work transferring, it's really the competency assertion um, being uh, what, what travels. The, the actual student work will be in, you know, Google Drive or wherever it is. You know, the assessment results will stay probably within the assessment delivery tool. Um, um, but the competency assertion is what we're looking to transfer into um, a format where you can get an integrated view of um, the learner's uh, competency. Um, Keith, do you want to say more about like the conversations you've been having with Gwinnett or um, how you see this transferability of computer science competencies? So, so first off, I'll echo what you just said, uh, Greg, and that is, is truly what it boils down to is um, I, I think this is a question that, that kind of coalesces around that, um, what we call a learner record store, and that is the, that's where that portability comes in. Um, so certainly for us, it's engaging in this conversation about um, how do we, how, how do we encase a, a learner or, or document quantify a learner uh, that lives beyond the institutional level. You know, certainly these folks that are in higher ed, uh, they've got to be very interested in this, uh, simply the, the portability beyond us. And so this is where that comes in. It's also the whole reason why um, we as an agency are beginning to transition from this idea of, uh, of just trying to measure the academic standard, but specifically look at the competency. 
you know, again, one of the perfect examples I use, um, so forgive me, I'm an old physics teacher, right? So, uh, you know, what does it mean that you got an A in physics one? It doesn't mean nearly as much as us to be able to quantify in the form of, you know, some type of digital credential or badge or something like that that says, um, you know, Greg, the student did very well in the area of electricity and magnetism. So that's got portability, right? And so that's a competency. Uh, and so that's where this, this information, uh, this conversation is going. And so obviously this was a very in, initial and an integral part of this conversation as it relates to case. So somebody at the LEA level, what we call a local district there, I, I think we've got some Gwinnett participants in the room. Um, you know, that's what they're looking at um, is, is the opportunity uh, to find a way to encapsulate a, a, a learner's um, information so that whenever they matriculate to the next agency, that be another state, that be to higher ed, uh, that be to the workforce or even to say the military, um, what that student takes with them ultimately in the form of their learner record store uh, is what's going to be of benefit, uh, greatest benefit to them, uh, for them also from a lifelong learning aspect as well too. Jill, did I hit on that okay? Thank you for, for sharing the perspective. Yep. Karen, do we have any other questions that you want, we need to address? There, there are a few more, Jill. Um, next question, who will ensure that the standards are correct, excuse me, correctly updated and correlated? And so, Keith, you, you're up again. I was going to say, I'll, I'll be happy to take that one. So that was, um, boy, that was fundamental question number one. So uh, I, I want to go back to some of the things that both Pepper and, and, and Brandon and, and well, even Ray uh, were talking about, and that is that the, the massive human capital required uh, to take what was presented in a human readable aspect, and that was that PDF who now has to go through the work of converting that into a machine readable format prior to um, case and, and the case um, standard, right? And so anytime a human gets involved in that, you can ensure we can, we can incur typos, we can incur uh, the end user taking liberties in, in making small manipulations of that. And whenever we're talking about high stakes testing and, and the association of assessment items to, uh, to, to digital um, and the supplies of digital content that are ultimately going to, you know, document the learning uh, for that assessment item, you see where we've got some real liability there. And so the fact of the matter is, is that at the end of the day, um, that's not even work that I do. So instead, so within, um, again, within teaching and learning and specifically within curriculum instruction, we have program managers and there's a program manager for, for every one of our content areas. So ELA, math, science, social studies, fine arts, health, and PE, uh, CT or CTAE, those are all ones uh, that that program manager is the de facto manager of those standards. And so that individual and I work, uh, and we're developing a, a, a framework and, a, and triaging the pathway by which we'll always ensure uh, that the most current version and the most correct version of those standards will sit out there. So to answer your question in one or two words is to say that it's our program manager that's going to be uh, responsible for, for answering that call. Okay, thank you, Keith. How is versioning handled? Greg, you want to oh. handle that one? Um, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to folks in North Carolina about their new math standards, and they were saying, "Well, maybe we'll hold off on doing case until we get our new our new framework in, in place." And I suggest, "Well, actually, maybe you know now's the perfect time. As you're going through a change, is actually a really good time to be using a tool like Salt because you can model the changes. So when I showed, for example, the um, old and then new." Computer, the Computer Science Teachers Association standards um, in code.org. If code.org had their old standards and their new standards in case and the crosswalk between them modeled, then you could just run an algorithm to update all of the code.org pages with the new standards. Um, so when we think about the state of New York, you know, and the changes that they've gone through with their academic standards and all of the downstream content, assessments, data warehouse, everything that's downstream from the state. 
anything that touches New York standards is being now manually recoded. Whereas if the state were to publish their old standards, their new standards, and, and the crosswalk between them in case format, then everyone in that ecosystem could just then update their alignments. And, and can I echo a little bit more uh, just to kind of uh, document a real world um, ex experience that we're living in? And so uh, I, I think a, a lot of, of the virtual learning staff, uh, specifically our Georgia virtual school staff are online. And so one of the real problems that they're faced with is is literally as we vet standards um, and, and we have a significant change, in, and I'll give you the real world example of, uh, and I identified earlier where we went from Georgia uh, performance standards to Georgia standards of excellence. Well, let's say that a student enters into high school during the time that um, the Georgia performance standards in say mathematics uh, or what that student entered in, well, that, the, those GPS standards follow that student through graduation in those particular courses, right? And so there's version one, but then secondarily to that, we have the following year when those ninth graders transition to 10th graders and new ninth graders come in. Well, now they've got mathematics courses that are equated and versioned to, to GSE. And so there's a real need for uh, Tammy Eckert, who is our, uh, our genius behind content standards and development. Um, you know, she, she really has to uh, find a way to uh, make sure that she's associating proper standards with proper courses uh, to ensure that we're uh, maintaining those courses until those children uh, matriculate to, to something beyond, say, K-12. Uh, and so there's a real need for that versioning that exists for us. And there's where uh, digitizing this and, and putting this in this machine-readable fashion is going to make it uh, infinitely easier for us to manage that as opposed to, uh, you know, previous attempts. Okay. Thanks, Keith. And Greg? This one might come back to you, or um, if other panelists um, want to um, jump in. Uh, one last question. If all alignments are done by framework owners, how can one gain visibility into their methods and trust those alignments prior to pulling those into their own platform for use? Or is that up to the group importing those alignments? Right, so, you know, part of what we're seeing in these crosswalks is people over a line. Content providers um, have a, a tendency to say that a piece of content is um, aligned to many, many standards. And so often when you're doing searches like this, then you end up with uh, falsely discovering too many objects, right? And that problem could be exacerbated if uh, through this crosswalk process. Um, you know, Asserting a crosswalk doesn't mean that it needs to be accepted. So just because some organization asserts that it has a crosswalk to maybe all of your standards, that doesn't mean that you need to, um, you know, to, to trust that crosswalk. Um, so the next generation of search tools, um, and I think I want to um, put out a, an advertisement for the IMS Global LTI resource search um, as the um, next piece in this puzzle. Um, we now need to use case um, and LTI resource search so you can search um, across crosswalks um, but with the ability to uh, to validate certain crosswalks more than others. Um, so, um, you know, those are the types of issues that we're going to need to be working out. Um, the spec itself of cases um, is very stable. Um, I don't expect there will be substantive changes to the case spec uh, for, um, for a while. Um, but the real action is really an implementation. The types of things that we've shared with you today um, and, um, you know, the, the, the case implementation task force can become a place where we talk about these issues and see whether changes are needed in case, whether new specs like L LTI research search are needed, um, or whether there are other types of agreements and tools that are necessary to, um, to enable this vision to, to, to work. Well, thank you. I want to again thank all of our uh, guest speakers today. We appreciate you very much. Uh, appreciate all of our attendees and the great questions that you've presented to us today as well. So as we get ready to wrap up, I just want to point out that we do have resources for our school districts for those of you who are from institutions available on our website. Please be sure to check those out. 
You can also find resources in our K-12 playbook. And we always want to encourage you to check out our certified product directory. It's the best way to establish a plug and play ecosystem that allows your tools and content to work together. If you're just starting out, you should review the resources that we've developed to help you know what to ask for from your vendors and what to include in RFPs. Our IMS Global offers assistance to our members who need help or guidance in determining your needs. The certified product directory contains the official listing of products that have passed IMS Global interoperability testing and certification. So definitely visit the product directory to see all of those products. And we have another webinar coming up soon, so please be sure to register for our next webinar coming up in October, Closing the Gaps to Improve Student-Centered Learning. We have some related resources that you may want to check out. These valuable resources are include a presentation and some RFP guidance to go with CASE. So for today, check out those additional resources and visit today the webinar detail page. Carol will be sending out information for you about how to access that resource page and as well as the recording following today's webinar. Thanks again to everybody for attending. Have a great day.